Welcome to Seminole Church. Hi, I'm Kim. You know, Seminole Church is more than just a place to attend worship services. We're a family of people who want to know God better and help each other along the way. You belong here. Remember, if you have any prayer requests or comments during the service, you can share them in the comment section, or if you'd rather keep it private, go to seminolechurch.com slash prayer. We'll be monitoring the comments and would love to pray for you. Did you know that there's a direct connection between your mouth and your heart? Today, we're going to learn how we can do a better job of making sure the words coming out of our mouths reflect the love we have in our hearts. Let's prepare ourselves with an awesome time of worship, and I'll check in with you afterward. Well, good morning. Let's worship and sing about God's love together. Would you stand and join us as we do that? verses of the Bible is Romans 8 28 and it says and we know that in all things God works for the good 
of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So he takes what the enemy means for evil in your life and God turns it for good. And that's what this next song is about. This song is full of scripture and truth. So let's sing this together. falls it won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph my God will never fail my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle we lost to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle we lost to you, Lord.
promises Time and time again You have proven You do just what you say Though the storms may come And the winds may blow Our may stand fast And let my heart learn When you speak a word It will come to Your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Your word remains the same. Yeah. 
Let's join heaven in singing these words right now. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty.
together. God, you are so worthy of our worship. On our best days and on our worst days, you are just as worthy. Father, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight. Whatever we do, may it glorify you. And God, I just pray that we would be a church who would love people as you love them through our words and our actions. We love you so much. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Seminole Community Church. We're glad you decided to join us today. There's an app for just about everything and SCC is no exception. But now our app is new and improved. Use the QR code on your worship guide to download it from the App Store or Google Play. You can use the app to watch video, sign up for classes, or check the events calendar. For instance, you could sign up for class 101 or 201, which will be offered again on February 11th from 1 to 4.30. If you're new to Seminole, class 101 is the perfect introduction. You'll learn about our history, our purpose, and why we do what we do. If you've already completed Class 101, it's time to move on to 201, where you'll learn how to deepen your walk with Jesus through prayer, Bible study, and scripture memorization. You can also use the QR code printed in your worship guide to sign up. If you have a middle or high school age student, Fuge Camp can be a life-changing experience for them. It will take place in July in the mountains of North Carolina for a total cost of $499. The initial deposit of $75 will guarantee them a spot and is due by February 4th. You can use the SCC app to make your deposit. We're about halfway through our 40 days of love and we've learned a lot and seen that expressing love in every area of our lives is more than a little challenging. And possibly one of the most challenging areas of all is in what we say. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here. People are out of the pavilion. I want to welcome those of you who are tuning in online. We're halfway through 40 days of love. And I know I, we had people here today. They weren't here last week or the week before, but they're like, well, we've been watching online. So we've kind of all made a commitment, or many of us have made a commitment, uh, to be at church six weeks in a row, the first six Sundays of 2024, or tune in online. And I know many of you have kept that commitment, or if you've missed a day, you could go back and, and uh, watch online and catch up. They're all, they're all there. Um, we've also been committing ourselves to read the, what's it called, the 40-day devotion, the relationship principles of Jesus. How many of you have been reading that, oh, awesome, great, really well-written book by Tom Holliday? And, um, and then Many of you have been meeting in your small groups, your 40-day small groups every week, and uh, that's been going well. And then the last way we've been engaging is on these memory verses. Uh, you can engage in one of these or two of these or all four of them if you want, and um, this is the year that the memory verses are as short as they've ever been. Uh, this week, week three, it was love rejoices with the truth. That's one you can memorize probably in five minutes. We'll love rejoices with the truth, 1 Corinthians 13, 6. This next week, we're memorizing 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. Also an easy one. Before we dive into our study, there's a couple of quick things I want to draw your attention to on the back of your program and then also update you. We, were, we started praying for Pastor Will John in Haiti, our pastor down there. Uh, last week, and I have an update, and we'll pray for Will John again. But on the back of your program, you'll notice Julie mentioned that we have a new church app. Last Easter, we rolled out our first church app ever. Many of you downloaded it. Man, was it pretty. It was pretty, but not functional. Um, it didn't do several key things that we needed it to do. 
the primary thing was it didn't integrate with our church database management system to allow people to sign up for all the events. We have so many things going on. Um, so this is why we made the switch. Uh, this has been in the works since Thanksgiving. It's not completely done yet. Um, we're going to launch it in, in, at Easter, but we had enough of it done, and we really wanted the kids to be able to sign up for Rock the Universe, pay online, and get their permission slips signed. It was the easiest we've ever done, Rock the Universe. Uh, maybe they're waking up around now. It's about 11 o'clock. I, I'm sure that they got back at midnight. Thank you, parents, for coming and getting your kids. I know that's a chore in the middle of the night. Uh, they had a great time at Rock, Rock the Universe last night. So the app works with several things. Signing up, you can see your giving history on it. There's a place to watch previous sermons. We're switching our streaming so that it'll even make live streaming easier on the app. Um, there's a box in here called check-in. Those of you with kids and you have to wait in line and get their name tags, this is going to allow you to, believe it or not, this is going to allow you, I'm sharing my password with somebody, um, this will allow you to not have to wait in line. As soon as you hit the parking lot, you can hit check-in, check your kids in, it'll print a, a name tag for you down in the kids' building or wherever that'll be. That's not active yet, but we're going we're gonna to open up a new feature every month for the next several months. So if you want to use the QR code and go grab the app now, you can take advantage of the features that are open, and as, they, as new features come available, I'll uh, point your attention to that. The other thing I wanted to mention is the Ridgecrest uh, Fuge Camp which I know your kids just, uh, they just hit you up with almost $100 to go to Rock the U, and now it's not another 75 for deposit. Uh, we have 70 seats secured for Fuge Camp. You can guarantee your spot by putting your deposit down. Now, I know if, if, if your teenager has just wrecked your, you know, you're like the, your ATM is out of cash, you need a cash infusion, come see me. I will give you a, uh, an extension on that deadline if you need it. And if you have kids who need, uh, who need a scholarship, I had, a, I had a beautiful little seventh grader, I think she's in seventh grade, come up to me and, and say, I have a friend of mine, but uh, they probably don't have enough money to go, to go. Is there any way we could give them a scholarship? I said, absolutely. Anybody you know that needs a scholarship, we have a very generous church. We raise over $15,000 a year uh, to help kids be able to go to camp, kids and chaperones. And um, so if you have someone and you're going, well, that, they don't have $75 right now, we'll help. Don't worry. Don't let finances be something that keeps your student or their friends from getting to go to Fuge Camp. Um, we'll trust God for all of that. Good grief. Last year they went in a prevost. Is that what they call that? When they pulled up with that, that million-dollar bus, I thought, this isn't a good idea. We should not let our teenagers on your prevost, you know. And now they even have a newer one they're bringing. So we go in style. Um, we used to be the redneck church. Now we're the prevost church. I don't know how that worked out. Somebody must be praying. Um, so si sign your kids up, and you can do all of that right on, right on the app as well. All right, I told you last week that Pastor Wiljon, our pastor in Haiti, uh, pastor of our 40-plus churches and the orphanage and the several schools and the clinic that we have there in the seminary, um, he has a mass in his abdomen. Um, he has to go to the DR, and we were also praying for the container, the Christmas container, to get there. All all the rice and the beans and the musical instruments and the, um, you know, everything that we sent, sent down to Haiti, all the Christmas boxes. Um, it's never Christmas at Christmas time in Haiti. It's always, well, we hope it's in January. Sometimes they had Christmas in March one year. Um, and it just depends on how long it takes to get, in, get through customs. But I texted Pastor uh, Doug and Pastor Todd this morning, and we got up. We got an update from Pastor Wiljohn's daughter, Jenny. Uh, she said, my parents, this was about a week ago. She said, my parents are leaving for the Dominican Republic on the 28th. God willing, next Sunday. Uh, they're going with a doctor who speaks Spanish. They found a ride with her brother Jerry's friend. So they're driving from Haiti to Santiago. Plan is for Jerry to join them after he gets his, his visa. Their son Jerry just got married December the 28th. So uh, him and his new bride are going to go over and help, help try to get them in. They've got a place to stay. So let's continue to pray for Will John. First, let's pray that he gets there today. Um, oh, and the container, she said they inspected and paid for the container. The container is through customs. Now it's waiting to be delivered this past week. Hopefully it's already there. Um, most of our communication is 
a week to a year behind whenever we've, I, I, every time I sell somebody, we have 41 churches, they'll say, oh, nope, it's 43. You know, three churches just happened in the last two weeks or whatever. So uh, let's take a moment to pray for Pastor Will Jean uh, and, um, and everything going on there. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, we love Will Jean. We join with all of the churches that he leads in uh, the schools and the clinic and the orphanage and the seminary, and just literally thousands of people in Haiti praying for him. And so many of our partnering churches from around the, the country and really the world. Um, and we just pray that you will heal him, that you'll help him get to the DR and get the, the right doctors that can find out exactly what's going on. And I just pray that you'll heal him or give them uh, the treatment plan that will heal him so that he can be restored to full health. Um, I know that his blood pressure has been low and that he's been experiencing dizziness. And um, none of that sounds good, Lord. I know that you can heal and we ask that you will. I know that he is, has tremendous faith, more faith than anybody I've ever met, and I just pray that you will continue to use him in a huge way uh, to reach Haiti for Jesus. And I pray for all of, all of the pastors that are under him, uh, that you will help all of his leadership and all of the pastors to, uh, to step up in his absence and, um, and carry that leadership burden. I pray for Madam Wiljean, uh, that you will give her um, wisdom and help her to make whatever decisions uh, that she's called on to make. And I, I thank you for his kids, for Jerry and Jenny. I pray that they'll be able to help their dad at this time. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank those of you who've been praying for me. The word got out that my, that my back was hurting last week. It was killing me. Um, I'm much better than I was last week. People were like, man, Jerry wasn't funny at all last week. And I was like, no, man, I was, I, was just, I was just praying to get through church. Like some of you, many of you probably pray for that. Oh, just get me through church. Um, I, know, I know, I hear your prayers. Um, it's moved from my back to my sciatica, so please don't stop praying. Um, I've tr- I, I'm seeing a chiropractor. I'm, see- I'm doing therapy. I'm doing stretching. I'm, you know, someone's like, have you had, tried these beet things, these beet chewies? And, oh, no, that's for blood pressure. Um, you know, everybody, I appreciate all your home re- and remedies. I'm doing most of those. I'm going to get a tennis ball today. And the um, main thing is just please pray. Right now, my back is like, or my sciatica, whatever. It's like level three in pain, level three in pain, level three in pain. Ten! Three in pain, three in pain. So if I like holler out in the middle of service, just assume it's not the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's an unholy spirit. Somebody's got my doll and poking me or something. And I um, apologize in advance if I scream at you. And I'll try to be more funny than I was last week, okay? We are in the middle of 40 days of love, as I said. We have been looking at how God loves us and then how we are to love others because of how much God loves us. God loves us so much, and then he says, and by the way, I want you to love everybody else the way I love you. And we are faced with but. I'm not God. <laughs> so it's a lot harder to love other people than it probably is for God to love us. And God says, no, 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 you don't understand. I want to love other people through you. I don't expect you to do all this on your own. In fact, let me just be the first to tell you, you can't do all this on your own. We have to have the Holy Spirit in us to love other people the way that God wants to, us to love them. He is loving them through us. This is his plan. So we're talking about today, how do we communicate love with our words? Because this is something, communication is something that affects all of us. When we talk about, when we talk about making love work in our relationships or making love work in our everyday life or making love work Monday through Saturday, well, communication is one of these things that we are constantly dealing with in our relationships every single week, but really every single day. So we're talking about how do we communicate love with our words? How do we love when it comes to this all-important subject of communication? And I wrote down for you in your program, if you'll fold that in half, the outline that's there, I want you to write down and circle a few things if you grab a pen in front of you. Um, I wrote down the dictionary definition of communication. I don't know how helpful this is going to be. Because when I read the the dictionary definition of communication is this. It is a process by which information is exchanged. You should circle the word exchange. It is a process 
by which information is exchanged between individuals through a common system, circle common, through a common system of symbol, signs, and behavior. I have found, and I imagine probably many of you have found, that in real life, communication, I wrote it down as a re, the reality definition of communication, at least that I've seen, it sounds very similar except for a couple of words. The reality definition of communication for most of us is it is a process by which information is confused, circle confused, by individuals through a conflicting, circle conflicting, system of emotions, behaviors, backgrounds, and desires. You change just a couple of words, exchanged for confused, in common for conflicting, and that usually is what the reality definition of communication is. Have you ever been talking to anybody like your wife or your husband or your children or maybe a coworker, and communication just seems to be going great. You are thinking, man, I'm getting through to them, and this is, this is a two-way street, and we just seem so, everybody's smiling, heads are nodding, we got communication down, Pastor Jerry, and then all of a sudden, the wrong word apparently slipped out of your mouth, and all of a sudden, everything goes nuclear. Now, it's funny to me that the word nuclear is spelled nuclear. And it isn't new, and it isn't clear at all. In fact, when it goes nuclear, it's like the big mushroom cloud can be seen from miles away, and we're powerless to stop it. It's like, I didn't, even, I didn't mean to say that that way. I didn't mean to say it in that tone. I didn't know the eyes were going to start rolling or the exasperation was going to start happening. And things were going so good just a minute ago. You ever been there? Why is communication so important in our relationships? I'll tell you why. In a relationship, all relationships are fueled by communication, just like your car. Your car runs on fuel, whether it's diesel or whether it's gasoline or whether it's electric or whether it's a hybrid. There's probably solar cars out there by now. Who knows? No matter what your car, how your car goes, it has some kind of fuel that propels it down the highway. It's the same way in our, in our relationships. Our relationships are fueled by communication. And you have to have the right fuel to make your car go. You can't put diesel in a gasoline engine. Well, you can. Have you seen the TikToks where the teenage girl calls her dad and says, Dad, I think I made a mistake. I put the green fuel in the, in the car and the dad goes ballistic. Like, don't get in the car, stop the car, pull over the car. And she's trying to convince him she put diesel and gasoline powered. in it. Ladies, this is not funny. No dad thinks this is funny, okay? Because we know that the right fuel has to go in the car. What happens if you fill up your car with water? Oh man. What happens if you, what if you poured milk in your car? By the way, milk's probably cheaper than gas sometimes, right? You know, wouldn't it be great if your car could, does a body good? What, what happens if you put antifreeze in your gas tank? What happens if you fill it with wiper fluid? There's a lot of things you could put in that, in that fuel tank. It has to be the right fuel to get your car to go. This is all common sense. We know that. Listen, it's the same thing in our relationships. You have to have the right communication in your relationships if you're going to propel your relationship forward for the rest of your life. And communication is not easy. How many of you figured this out? Communication, how long does it take for you to figure it out? I mean, when you get married, how long does it take before you realize that, man, we, we struggle at communication? I would say that most people, they learn this way before the end of the honeymoon, don't they? In fact, Reality is you learn it before you get to the altar because if you've ever planned a wedding, oh my goodness, there's plenty of opportunities for conflict and miscommunication in planning for a wedding. James 3 verse 2 says, says it this way. This is the first half of verse 2. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. Someone just got nudged. We all make many mistakes. 
For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. I want you to circle if we could. That's all it takes to be perfect is if we could control our tongues? Yes, that's why there's no perfect people, apparently. I confess I'm not perfect. I confess I often make mistakes. I often, when it comes to my words with communication in my relationships, I often say stupid things. I stay, say foolish things. Anybody else want to join me on that confession, by the way? You know, where we make mistakes? It's the easiest thing in the world to say the wrong thing, isn't it? It's so easy. And because of that, when it comes to our words, when it comes to communication, a lot of times we live with frustration in our relationships. We, we feel like, am I ever going to get this right? Am I ever going to get to the right place where I finally don't miscommunicate or make mistakes when I, when I communicate? I mean, I'm almost 57 years old. I turned 57 years in just a couple weeks on February 12th. You should be writing this down. On February 12th, I turned 57 years old. And I should have this down by now, shouldn't I? And all the 67 and 77 and 87-year-olds, and we've got someone in the 90s here today, they're like, nope, you never get to perfect in communicating with each other. Jesus, he's the one who teaches us how to communicate. By the way, before I move on, communication is not easy. Let me read you some quick statistics. These are kind of depressing. We live in a nation where 50% of the wives, half of the wives, say husbands don't communicate. I thought that was the most encouraging statistic. I thought it would be higher than that, didn't you? I'm like, you mean 50% of the husbands do communicate? We are making progress. <laughs> the other thing that I read was 86% of those divorced say that the number one cause was deficient communication. Oh, well, that's true. And another one said that over 25%, this was sad to me, over 25% of young people indicate that they have never had not even one meaningful conversation with their father. And when you get down to it, communication, it's not a science. It's not a formula. It's not math. It's more of an art form. It would be so nice if we could go A plus B equals C with communication. Do this plus this. This is the, the theorem and the Possibly you could prove that this would help you. It'd be, that would be great. But there's so many things about communication that are more of an art form, so many nuances, so many opportunities for miscommunication that we need an expert to teach us how to communicate, to teach us how to communicate in love to the people in a relationship that we love. Jesus is an expert in communication. He's also an expert in love. In fact, we can learn from Jesus' own words. If you read the New Testament, you read the Gospels, you focus on the conversations that he has, the red words that he has, if you have a red word, Gospel. We can learn from his example and from his own words if we pay attention to the conversations that Jesus had. And we can come up with at least four lessons that I want to give you today, four keys that I want to give you today that will help you. It'll start helping today in your relationship with your spouse, with your kids, with your parents, with your siblings, with everybody in your life. The first thing that Jesus teaches us about the foundation of communication is that the foundation of communication is trust. Will you fill that in? The foundation of communication is trust. In the Sermon on the Mount, this is Jesus teaching the greatest sermon ever taught in Matthew 5, 7, 537, sorry. Jesus, Jesus says this, he says, just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Jesus is saying that we need to mean what we say and say what we mean. We cannot have high quality communication without high quality trust. When there's great trust, there's going to be great communication. With little trust, there's going to be little communication. And with no trust, there's going to be no communication. If I can't trust what you say, I don't trust you. I don't trust what you're saying. Then it doesn't matter how eloquently you put it. In fact, the more eloquent you are, if I don't trust you, 
the more that confirms my distrust, it seems. So whether we're working on an existing relationship or building a new relationship or possibly even rebuilding channels of communication in a damaged relationship, it all has to begin, number one, with trust. Because how many lies does it take for us to stop trusting someone? 10% of what they tell us isn't true. Do, do you trust them 90% of the time? No. If 10% of what you tell me isn't true, then I don't trust you not 10% of the time. I don't trust 100% of what you say because I don't know what the 10% is. It's interesting that experts tell us that there are six different categories that words fall into when we speak them. The first is what we mean to say. What you mean to say, that's one category. The second category is what you said, what you actually say. And most of the time, what we mean to say is not what we actually say. The third category is what the other person hears, the actual words that come into their ear. And then the fourth category is what they think they hear. Because what they hear and what they think they hear often are not the same either. And the fifth category is what the other person says about what you said. You, you meant to say something, but you said something else. They heard something, and they heard it differently than they heard it. And then they say, you know what Jerry said? And they tell someone what they think I said. And then the sixth category is what you think the other person said about what you said. And then I hear about it, and I go, you know what they said I said? And it doesn't even match what they said I said. And no wonder we're all confused, because listen, these six categories are confusing if you're telling the truth. So if you sprinkle in a little dishonesty and mix in a few lies, it's no wonder it's such a big mess that we have with communication. Jesus says, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. And our truth is built on these two tiny little words. Every parent knows this is true. Do you remember when your kids were little? Maybe you got little ones right now. And you'd come home after a tough day of work and they'd like hit you right as you came in the door and like, daddy, 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 can we go do such and such tonight? And you would say, okay, or sure, or that sounds fun. And what they heard was Y-E-S, yes, loud and clear. And if yes changed later to no, oh, it doesn't matter what the reason is. You have broken your promise. And if you have a little, you know, you have one of some of those kids aren't so loosey-goosey. They're, they're like, they're like a legalistic, you know. You, 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 they, they, they like split every other. They're like, you prom, but you promised or you lied, right? And that's a big thing. As a parent, we know every word we say is under the microscope. You know, I always say, give me a fifth grade lawyer, man. They are the best lawyers. Yeah, but you said, you know, they remember everything, right? Often in ways we don't understand, our words impact them. When I was a kid, I have to be careful, my mom's here up on the front row. When I was a kid, my parents used the I don't see why not method. I've used that myself. It's a good method. I'm going to teach it to you. How many of your parents use the I don't see why not? Do you know what I mean? Did your parents ever, ever use it? Here, 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 let me give you an answer. It'd be Monday or Tuesday. And I would say this. I would say, hey, there's a get together at so-and-so's house on Friday night. Can I go? And they would fire back with, we don't see why not. Is that a yes or a no? Now, to the novice, you, or the untrained ear, you may assume that sounds like a yes. Of course you can go, Jerry. We don't see any reason why you couldn't and shouldn't go have fun with your friends. How many of you think that's what we don't see any reason why not means? You don't know about the implied yet, do you? What is an implied yet, Jerry? Oh, 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 let me tell you. An implied yet 
is a tricky little nuance of the English language that gives its purpose is to give parents cover when they change their mind. Later, let me illustrate. It's Monday or Tuesday. Hey, they're going to be get together at so-and-so's house on Friday night. Can I go? We don't see any reason why not. Is that a yes or a no? Wrong question. The right question is, is there an implied yet? They say, we don't see any reason why not. What they mean is, we don't see any reason why not yet. We don't see any reason why not yet. What that means is, if at any time in the week we discover a reason why not, then we can change to the not and no, you're not going. And it could be a big reason, a little reason, it could be multiple reasons or no, no good reason at all to the teenager. So parents, I invite you to try this, the implied tricky nuance of communication. These are the ways that we can erode trust. With our, the first one's easy. We know what this one is. When any relationship with our kids, with our spouse, with our coworkers, with it doesn't matter who it is. The first one is lies. Will you fill that in? And it's funny because lies is big there, but man, when I look at it on the back screen way back there, it's like lies, just like five foot tall. We all lie. Everyone lies. I try so hard to never, never, never tell my kids a lie. Um, I want them to know at least dad will be straight with me. He'll tell me the truth. Um, but the truth is we all lie in big and little ways. The most, by the way, the most famous story about lying in American history. Do you know the story? It comes from the story of George Washington cutting down. What kind of tree? Anybody remember? Cherry tree, right. I don't even know if they still teach this in school. George Washington's dad asks him, George, young George, who chopped down the cherry tree? And George is supposed to have said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. It was me. Problem with that story. Problem with that story is it was written in a biography by Parson Weems in the 19th century, and he made the whole story up. So the most famous story in American history about not lying is a big fat lie. It's no wonder we're so messed up, right? Everybody lies and it erodes trust. The second word I want you to write down is flattery. Flattery is just a positive lie designed to increase your standing in another person's eyes. Because flattery uses another person's need for acceptance against them. It is a heartless, manipulative lie. And we're not talking about just looking for the, the positive in somebody. We're not just talking about accentuating the positive and, and encouraging them. We're talking, flattery is when you lie about somebody's skills or actions for the purpose of personal gain. And flattery invites someone to believe something about themselves that just isn't true. And if they believe it, it can drift their life or spin their life into the wrong direction. And flattery makes it into the book of Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 26, 28. This is a wisdom book written by Solomon. He says, a lying tongue hates its victims. When we lie, we're not loving. We're the opposite of that. And, a, and flattering words cause ruin. Flattery is another one. Lies, flattery. Third one I want you to jot down that can erode trust in a relationship is broken promises. When we break a promise, when we give our, you know, it used to be, or we like to think that it was used to be, that, you know, a person's word was their bond. I can't believe how prevalent this has become even in Christian circles, because one of the things I've learned over the last three dec de decades pastoring a church is often people, even when they've committed something, like they've made a commitment, I'm committing, or sometimes even if they've signed a contract, Christians will often, they think nothing of breaking their commitment or breaking their contract by just saying something like, well, God is leading us in a different direction. 
or we've prayed about it and God is telling us to do something different. It's all too easy to use God as an excuse by some people to break a promise. Maybe that's why Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Look, I, I've learned this. I think you probably have or you will. I think God gets blamed for a lot of people's own decisions. And like, I'm going to do what I want to do, but I'm going to tell everybody God told me to. Just because people say, well, we've prayed about it, and God's leading us to do such a that doesn't make it true. You're okay to use your own discernment and go, yeah, that's not adding up. I don't believe it. Just because they attach God's name to it doesn't necessarily, God gets blamed for a lot of stuff. Don't use God when you want to renege on a promise, when you want to break your word. We can't have high quality communication without a high level of trust. Well, what if the trust is already gone? What if I've broken trust? How do I rebuild? How does someone rebuild trust after they've told a lie or after they've broken a promises? How can we do that? Rebuilding of trust always takes a combination of trust plus time. We want everything now. We want everything to be microwaved. We want everything instant gratification. You can't do this with rebuilding trust. In fact, trust takes time. We shouldn't just trust everything everybody says. We trust, trust is built over time. Rebuilding of trust takes more time. And you do that by being trustworthy and telling the truth for a whole day. And then the next day you do it again. And the next day you do it again. And you got three of those strung together. And when you get 30 of those strung together where you've told the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God, kind of a, I'm telling the truth. You get 30 of those together, that's a month. You get 12 of those together, that's a year. That's how you build trust back, by being honest and trustworthy one day at a time, one hour at a time, and you keep no step backwards, all steps forward in this whole area. But it's hard work. Rebuilding a foundation of trust is even harder work. You know, it reminds me of when, it's almost 19 years ago now, 18 and a half years ago, when Hurricane Katrina came through the Gulf, wiped out New Orleans, wiped out uh, Mississippi. Our church, we took about 50 people uh, to Biloxi, to uh, Gulf Shores, Mississippi, actually. And the, the houses that we, we mudded, that we took down to the bare studs, were, were in Biloxi. And and so in this neighborhood we went in, some of the houses were gone. They were just wiped away. There's nothing but a slab there. And others of them, with the search didn't come, they filled up with water and, and, the, and the water burst the walls out. And then another block or two other, they slowly filled up with water. They stayed underwater for 10 to 12 hours. So 12 feet of water, 10 to 12 hours, and then they receded out, and we went in, and we had to tear these things down to the stud. You took out all the drywall, all the carpet, all the cabinets, everything that was ruined. And people rebuilt those homes. But here's what they had to do. They had to, before they were allowed to rebuild, they had to test the foundation because nobody had ever had houses that were filled with water, ocean water. You know, we were going in there five weeks later finding dead fish, you know, dead fish along with you know, your precious um, pictures and your, your diploma, your diploma and a perch, you know, in the same drawer. And you, some of you who went, you can probably imagine the smells are coming back to you as I describe this. Nobody had ever had houses that were under the ocean water for 10 hours. They didn't know what that was going to do to the foundation. So all the foundations had to be tested before they would even allow them to to start the process of rebuilding. And let me tell you something. It, however many months it takes to build a house from scratch, when you're having to rebuild a house that's been flooded and underwater, literally underwater. I mean, you thought you've been in the recession. You thought your house was underwater. These were literally underwater. Okay. And it has to, you have to make sure you have a, you have to make sure the foundation is solid before you rebuild. And it takes a lot longer to rebuild a house than it does to build a house for the first time. And even that takes a long time. It's the same thing with a relationship. When you're going to rebuild a relationship and rebuild a relationship with trust, it's going to take time. And it's not going to happen overnight because 
we broke trust. Rebuilding is like we broke the house. Now we've got to rebuild it. Can't do it as fast as we did it the last time. But it can happen. Same thing's true in relationships. It's been washed away or eroded when trust has been washed away. But it takes more work and more time, but it is so worth it. Because you can end up with your relationship being stronger than it ever was. Those houses that are there now are stronger and better than they were before that storm. And it can be the same thing in our relationships. But it, it takes time, but it's worth it. Second thing that Jesus teaches us, if you write this down, is there is a connection between my mouth and my heart. There's a connection between my mouth and my heart. Just like if you're driving down the road, just like there's a connection between your foot and the accelerator. In other words, when you slam your foot to the floor, what happens? It throws you in the back of the seat and your car lunges, lurches forward because there's an obvious connection between my foot and the accelerator. And the Bible tells us there's the same kind of connection between my mouth and my heart. Matthew 12, 34 says, whatever is in your heart determines what you say. Circle the words in your heart. Because sometimes we feel like, well, well, well how did, why did I say that? Or I'm so surprised that came out of my mouth. None of us are surprised. You shouldn't be surprised because what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. And in our 40 days of, of love uh, group study this, uh, in week two, last week, um, we had in the video, the video compared our lives to a full cup of coffee. If your coffee cup is filled almost to the rim and somebody bumps into you or your coffee gets jiggled, some people don't like the word jiggled, and jiggled is one of those words that make people a little squeamish. They're like, oh, don't say jiggled. And I say jiggled as many times as I can say jiggled as soon as I find out somebody doesn't like me to say jiggled. It's like this like rebel streak in me that wants me to figure out, can I get jiggled, jiggled, jiggled? And all jiggled bells, jiggled bells, jiggled all the way. You know, is there a way that I can... Bad pastor, I know. But since we had someone in our small group bring that up on Wednesday night, I thought for her, to you, Megan, uh, I would try to work that in. I said in the first service, I probably shouldn't say any J words in the whole second service, but I couldn't resist myself again. What happens when somebody bumps into us and our coffee cup is jiggled when we have it full of coffee? Coffee spills out. Why does coffee spill out of a coffee cup? Let me ask it a different way. What spills out of a coffee cup when we're bumped and it gets jiggled? Not coffee. Whatever's in the cup. If coffee's in the cup, coffee spills out. But what if Kool-Aid is in the cup? Kool-Aid spills out. What if milk is in the cup? Milk spills out. What if water's in the cup? Water spills out. Our life is like a coffee cup. Our heart is like this coffee cup. Whatever is in our heart whatever's in our life, that's what's going to spill out. So you can't go through life without getting jiggled. You can't go through life without getting bumped. And the people that are going to bump you and jiggle you the most are the people that you live with. Because when you're in close proximity, you're in a minivan with them. Oh man, they're going to get on your last nerve, right? And, and, and people bump into us. And here's what's happened. What's so funny is we have this, I don't know what's wrong with it. We we're, our heart's filled with anger. Our heart's filled with judgment. Our heart's filled with all these things. And when somebody bumps into us and our life gets jiggled and it spills all out, anger spills out, judgment spills out, you know, um, bad words spill out, you know, um, frustration spills out. Oftentimes, you know who we get mad at? We get mad at the, don't bump me. You bumped me. You jiggled me. You don't get to go through life without getting bumped. And be, and be, life will jiggle you, okay? I hope you're over the fear of this word by now. We should be concerned that it's our heart. That's why, I mean, that's what happens. You bump into somebody, they get all angry at you, and then they're mad at you for making them angry. And it's like, that's what's in our heart. So we should be looking at our heart. That's why there's a mess when angry words, hurtful words, judgmental words, fearful words. It's what's in our heart comes out of our mouth. Whatever is in my heart, it's inevitable. It's going to spill out. You can try to keep it all bottled up. But it's like trying to hold back. A, you're trying to like dam up a river. It's just going to build, 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 and blah, all over every. You're going to spill the whole thing. 
all over everybody. And all the bitter words and all the sarcastic words are going to come out. How do we avoid this? How do we not let the pressure build up? How do we break the pattern? Well, we have to realize what Jesus teaches, that we have to fight this battle on two fronts. We have to pray about this battle on two fronts. Pray that Jesus will help change our heart. He's the only one who can. We've got to put good things in our heart, not more anger, not more bitterness, not more sarcasm, not more judgment. We put good things in our heart, loving things in our heart. And then we ask him to also help us change our words. We ask him to help us clean up our mouth. You know, wash your mouth out with soap, how your first grade teacher used to say it. They probably don't do that anymore. I'm sure they don't do that anymore. I mean, that would be on, that would be on viral if they did that anymore. You know, so you need to wash your mouth out with, you know, God's word. And metaphorically, of course. And then ask Jesus, Jesus, please help change my heart and change my words. Here's the thing. He wants to help you. You're not in this alone. He wants to be a savior of your everyday life. All right, third thing. Did I get everything done in that one? Yep. Number three, Jesus teaches that communication that makes an impact is honest. The best examples come from Jesus. Jesus, he's God in human flesh. So when you read the New Testament and you look at all these dozens and dozens of conversations that he has, Jesus was honest. When it comes to Jesus communicating to people, it's amazing to see it or to read about it because he had this honesty about him. Now, it wasn't brutal honesty. It was clear honesty. It was loving honesty, clear honesty, never brutal honesty. Some people are proud of that. I'm just brutally honest. I just tell it like it is, but not in love. You, you're proud about telling it like it is just because we all say that we value honesty, but when it comes to our relationships, when it comes right down to it, a lot of times it's easier just not to be fully honest, to be less than honest. Because honesty is a lot of hard work. And because we got to think through how to say it the right way. We got to think through, is this the right timing? We have to maybe say, say it honestly, and that's going to lead to an explanation and a longer conversation. It's way easier if I, just, if I just be nice instead of honest because this conversation will be a lot quicker and I can get on the rest of my day. It's not going to be as difficult. But the problem is nice doesn't change anything. Nice doesn't move the relationship ahead. Nice doesn't change my heart or anybody else's heart. So we don't learn anything from being nice. We, we learn from being honest. Not honest in a hurtful way, but honest in love. In fact, how do we do it? It's in Ephesians 4.15, tells us how to do this. We speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. I want you to circle the phrase, speak the truth in love. Circle those, what is that, five words? Speak the truth in love, five words. Truth without love doesn't work. It has to be by in truth and love. It takes both. Some people, all they have is truth. They use truth like a weapon. They weaponize truth. They don't tell the truth. They aim the truth. Or they launch the truth. Or they detonate the truth. And sometimes truth hurts. But it doesn't have to maim, kill, or destroy. And people need to see that when we're telling them the truth, that we're telling them the truth in love, and we're not trying to maim, kill, or destroy them, even though what we say might hurt in some ways. It takes truth and love. Ephesians 4.29 says, Don't use... Oh man, this is a tough one. Don't use foul or abusive language. That means don't cuss like a sailor. Okay, I know I have to explain that. That, that means don't say bad words. Okay, don't, that means don't filth and foul, filth and foul, filth and, filth and foul. Do I need to give you a list of the words? Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Circle good and helpful. Is everything I say good and helpful? Do I use foul language? Do I use abusive language? Abusive language is, you never, you always, you're just like your mom, dad, whatever. Love without truth is equally disastrous. Apart from honesty, relationships will suffer from lack of trust. 
Proverbs 27, 5 says, An open rebuke is better than hidden love. We all love people, have people around us who sing our accolades. They tell us all the great things that we have in our life. You're so good. You're so smart. You're so talented. You're so, they, they say all those great things. But when push comes to shove, we need a few people that we're close enough to, that we're intimately in relationship with, who, true friendships, that they'll, they'll give us the honest words. They'll say, hey, you know, when you, when you said that, when you blasted them, that came across wrong. That is not how you think you said, you said it. Or um, they'll say, you know, hey, I heard what you said, but you're coming at it from your perspective and there are other perspectives. And you might want to put yourself in that other person's shoes that they didn't, they don't have the same perspective you have or the same upbringing or the same core beliefs or the same worldview. And they're the people that help us in our lives because they'll share the honest words of truth with us and they're important first corinthians 13 6 that's from our love chapter says love does not rejoice about injustice but rejoices whenever the truth wins out there's this joy in our life when we know that truth wins wins out in our life there's an excitement when we see the difference that truth can make all right i gotta keep cranking because i'm almost out of time number four if we leave this you want to just leave this one blank I know all the people, all the OCD people will go creep. The Bible teaches that when we're angry, we need to be careful with our words. Careful with our words. Really, I should add the word especially careful with our words because we need to be careful with our words even when we're not angry. But when we're angry, we need to be especially careful because words, careful because words are powerful. So we have to be careful with them. Every one of us knows the impact of wrong words. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 tells us how to handle this and gives us a warning. It says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. I want you to circle the six words that say, don't let the sun go down. Will you fill that in? Don't let, circle those words. Anger in our communication can make its way into our relationship and really ruin things. We all experience anger when we argue, and we all argue. Many of us argue constantly in our relationships. Everybody argues, but we have to learn to deal with the anger and not let that dominate a disagreement or an argument because this verse talks about communication being almost like a battlefield, like someone has to be when communication or anger turns communication into a battlefield, um, it means that there's going to be a winner and a loser. And, and when we are in a battlefield, when we're fighting and arguing, sometimes, some of us, we respond by, we, we just dig a foxhole. We, we pull all the way in. We tur- what I call turtle up. You know, our head pops in, our arms fire, and then we're like, I, we, don't, we clam up. We don't, we don't engage. It's like, I'm just going to wait, and I'm just going to watch and wait for the right time, and then I'll spring out and strike, right? Uh, we'll get even later. Some people decide they're going to store up. They, they store up arrows and, and bombs and, and missiles, and, and they have this, like, armory, this munitions dump, and they're just, like, they're just building, 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 until one day they're going to launch it all at one time. Other people like me, I'm, I'm more of an artillery person. I, I pull out when I'm in an argument. It's like, all right, I'm making my last stand again today. You know, I'm going to pull it all out and use up every, every arrow in the quiver, every, every missile, that all the big guns. We don't save anything. We, uh, usually we respond to anger in those ways. Uh, I overreact. I am an overreactor. Any other overreactors in here? Most of them won't raise their hand, but they're all being pointed at right now. They don't know it. There's a somebody behind you. Because when we, treat, when we treat communication as a battleground, we think that somebody has to win. But this verse tells us that, oh no, you don't win and your spouse doesn't win. Everybody loses. The whole family loses. In fact, it tells us there's only one person who wins. Do you see who wins in that? The devil's the one who wins. He gets a foothold in our relationship. It tells us how do we not let Satan win. It says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. That's the how. That's why I had you circle that. 
Maybe you've heard that at a wedding or something. You know, somebody stood up and made a toast and they said, whatever you do, you know, don't go to bed angry. You know, um, maybe, un- Uncle Charlie, Uncle Charlie, uh, he's, he's been married nine times. He's finally got it down. This is great advice, right? Sorry, Charlie. Chicken of the sea. This isn't just advice at a wedding. This is actually a command of God to don't go to bed angry. Um, it's not a little advice, it's command. It, why? Because God loves us and he knows, he knows how important it is for us to be in a healthy relationship with other people. So he says, don't, don't go to bed angry. Um, work this out before you go to sleep or else he knows that he knows how we're wired. He knows bitterness will take a root and, um, and impact our relationship long term. Now, the Bible says we don't have to do, resolve everything immediately. In fact, sometimes it's good to count to 10. Sometimes it's good to count to 100. Or maybe you need to get in the car and drive around the block. Probably shouldn't do that if you're angry. You should walk around the block. But you can cool off and come back. But, but let's get this solved by the end of the day so Satan doesn't have a foothold in your relationship. So when Nancy and I, 30-something years ago, were in the newlywed class, um, we... We had friends of ours. They were newlyweds too because they were part of the class. And her, she, her name was Christine. She was from Arkansas. Now, Christine was very Southern. Southern Belle from Arkansas. And Christy always had these Meemaw says moments. And Christy would say, my Meemaw always says, and then it was like, you better get out your pen and write this down because this is going to be ancient wisdom. And one of the times she said that when she got married, Meemaw Mima always used to say, if you're going to go to bed, if you're going to go to bed angry, make sure you go to bed naked. <laughs> N-E-K-K-I-D is I think how you spell that. That's Mima chapter 1, verse 1. Mima 1, 1. You're going to go to bed angry. You might as well go to bed. You better go to bed naked. Um, for newlyweds, they understand that lingo. For the rest of us, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you. I just throw it out there because I remember it 36 years later. You probably will too. You won't remember what I said, but you'll remember me, Ma One One. <laughs> All right. So, in closing, let's commit to building trust in our relationships. Um, to realize that the key to our relationships is how we speak to each other. And the key to how we speak to each other is our heart. I don't know about you, but I need God's help with my heart. And I need God's help with my words. So the best thing we can do is ask him for that. So I'm just going to ask you to pray a very short prayer. Let's bow our heads as we close. I invite you to join me in this prayer. And you know, might, might want to just say these words back to God in your own heart, in your own mind. Say, Lord, do something with my words this week. Instead of me trying to control my tongue, Lord, I'm going to trust you to control my tongue. I'm trusting you to guide my words. And I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for your strength. Jesus, guide me into honest words. And I'm asking for your help because I want my heart to change. And I know you love me and I know you'll help me. So I'm asking for it in Jesus' name, amen. Hi, it's Kim. James 3.2 says that if anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. Obviously, we can all do a better job of communicating. I hope what you heard today will help. Enjoy the rest of your weekends.